coming back to, I guess, the, the mechanisms or the physiology that's at play here, if we think about the loss of muscle function um, and, and also strength that occurs as someone ages, particularly if someone has sarcopenia, is it mostly changes to muscle tissue itself? Is it the nervous system? Is it vasculature? Is it the brain, uh, peripheral nerves? What do you think kind of best explains this change in strength and muscle function that we see? Yeah, there's a lot of factors. So if we start, I suppose, almost from the central nervous system, there are changes in different aspects of the brain, the spinal cord that um, underpin the sort of the action potentials that are generated and sent to the the agonist, the synergist, and even the antagonist of muscles to make sure there's no coactivation or minimal coactivation where required. So a host of those things, and we know there's substantial neuroplasticity that still exists in, in the CNS. I remember reading books 20-something years ago, how that was really novel. Like Shepard and Carr, these physios from Sydney, had a textbook I, I found on special. I was like, wow. All these neurological disorders can still improve their function through exercise where it all sort of thought these um, disorders were sort of neurodegenerative and there was no way back. Um, but it's great to see neurophysiotherapy and exercise physiology making some big improvements in their function. So there are a host of things there. There's definitely neural um, adaptations at the, in the peripheral. So we know older adults don't recruit their type 2 mode units as easily as um, younger adults. So it can also be not just the recruitment, but there's a relative lack of them because of that inactivity of the higher sort of intensity activities. We know in terms of the muscle itself, there's greater infiltration of um, fat into the, the muscle itself. So those fatty infiltrations are going to reduce the force generating capacity. We have a reduction in um, specific tension, which is the ability of a cross-sectional area to reduce force. So, and we also get a loss of sort of coordinated activity of all these different muscles. So if we think of almost anything we do as human, Simon, it involves a whole host of very precise interactions in time and space between agonists, synergists or stabilizers, whatever you want to call them, and the antagonistic muscles. So you can't walk well if your gastroc and your soleus muscles as an antagonistic pair are both active. Um, so again, some of the spasticity disorders we see where we have that coactivation, the joints makes function really difficult, increases energy expenditure, etc. So again, there's plenty of research at that level that shows that older adults have more coactivation at joints and often in eccentric contractions. So that might mean an older adult walking downstairs, for example, or walking down a hill has less control of their, their limb segments because of that coactivation, maybe greater muscle energy expenditure. And particularly, there is a bit of research I've seen where older adults who go to the gym, they're more at risk of having a fall in that hour or two after their gym session. So particularly if they've done some pretty heavy lower body exercise, like we know like if you've done a heavy lower body session, your legs just feel like jelly. You don't feel that stable. Um, walking down a set of stairs can be a challenge. You now add 40 years onto your own body to do that and that risk of falls is now increased. So even things like that, we still need to maybe get the message out that while um, these forms of exercise are beneficial, you are at a slightly greater risk of falls in the couple of hours thereafter. Just like an athlete doing Nordic hamstring curls is doing that to reduce their risk of hamstring injury. If those hamstrings are really fatigued and then they do a soccer or an Australian football training session where they're sprinting, jumping and kicking, you're probably increasing your risk of, of injury to some extent in that session straight after. So how we, I suppose, get that message and just, just to be a little bit careful post-session, probably not a great idea to then go off and do some bushwalk where it's going to be slippery up and downhill surfaces after a heavy leg training session, as an example. Went off on a tangent a little bit there, perhaps, but yeah. 